USA Warrior Stories is a not-for-profit organization designed to record, archive, and share videos of veteran stories to help veterans make a connection with one another and to help us all better understand their sacrifices for our freedoms. Uh, I went to high school in uh, Walt Whitman High School in Huntington. Um, I went to Cornell University and I graduated in 1969 and I was soon drafted <laughs> into the Army. My basic training started out in Fort Dix, but I qualified for flight school, so they sent me, I didn't realize what that meant, they sent me to Fort Polk, Louisiana for basic training. From there I went over to Fort Walters for flight school. That didn't work out. I got sent to uh, Fort Gordon for MP school, graduated Military Police Academy. Uh, they sent me to Vietnamese language school in El Paso, Texas, Fort Bliss, and from there I went to Vietnam in 1971. And I was um, on uh, a post in Long Bend, and uh, I just wanted to do my two years and get out. I was an E-nothing, and that's the way I wanted it, and just do it, serve my time and go. But I'm 23, 24 years old with college education. These poor guys are 17, 18, 19 years old. So somebody had to step up because we were losing people and it was from a lack of supervision and I did that. So I became patrol supervisor of a military police unit. And I had 26 guys. I had 14 guys work gates, 14 guys work patrol, I had two dog units and we worked uh, uh, six weeks on, six weeks off, 12 hour days. And I had, uh, we were in charge of anything from civil to combat involving 40,000 GIs and 60,000 Vietnamese. Every day was just something, you know, just uh, extreme situation, to say the least. I got an early out. I was there eight months, nine days, and, and, and 12 hours, but who's counting? Uh, and what was interesting about that is uh, I took me 45 years uh, when I came home to, to watch a history channel and I got a four month early out to find out that my position was overrun three weeks after I left. So I don't know what happened to those poor guys after I was, I was there, but uh, you know, it just kind of took me back a little bit. To overcome the jungle, you don't fight the jungle, you become part of the jungle. When I came home, a part of that jungle came with me. And that led me to uh, a New York City race uh, in business, where I just ran and ran and ran. I ran for 45 years. And I didn't realize until I'd retired that it was to mask some of the experience and some of the things that I had seen in the service. And all of a sudden, it hit me. I, you know, when I stopped and I slowed down, I retired, and it just hit me all at once. And I was getting not only nightmares, I was getting daymares. My private insurance got cut off, and uh, I, I had a sleeping medication. It was the only thing that worked for me. So I went to the VA to see if they could help me, and they, through a series of meetings, uh, they couldn't prescribe it either, but through a series of meetings, they tried to help me uh, with different things that they could prescribe. And, that, and finally, after about six months, I got up and I said, you know, uh, thank you very much, appreciate all your help. Uh, and they said, well, wait, 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 wait. Since, since we've been talking over five months, you have some issues that should be explored. And uh, they dealt into my service record and they looked at some of the things that I was involved in and immediately got classified uh, with about, with a 100% disability before, before it was done. Beyond that, in fact, I had Agent Orange also. So part of the therapy that the VA was very offered to me is they, they tested me. They said, why don't you take some tests as far as employability and things like that. Maybe we could find something for you. And what happened was I tested that I couldn't put a, a, a I couldn't nail a, a nail into a piece of wood, but I, st I tested very high in salesmanship is what I did for a living. And I tested very high in art, which I never really did. So with their help, I started enrolling in, in art classes at School of Visual Arts, New York Academy of Arts. I even went to Metropolis Museum of Art here at the Southampton Cultural Center. And what happened is uh, I started looking for material to paint. And what was interesting, I went back to my old pictures of, of Vietnam. Certainly there was a lot of shock and awe. I saw it every day. 
I saw it every day. There's nothing anybody's going to tell me that I didn't see. But you know what? My pictures were on the lighter side. Maybe that's where my mind was. And my pictures were of people have to live. If the bombs are bursting in here, that doesn't make any difference. They still want to feed their families, survive, have a happy life. And it was a lighter side of Vietnam. And I started to paint them. And it helped me to heal. And it certainly is something that should be seen. I found what it says here. I found Vietnam to be a beautiful country with some beautiful people. They were all trying to do what we all try to accomplish, survive, feed their families, be successful, and have a happy life. That's my theme here. What we represent now is we have a, a series of seven photographs, full description, original picture, and then the painting. Now, in this case, this was Vung Tao, which was an in-country R&R situation. You could either go to Thailand, you could go to Australia, go to Vung Tau. I picked Vung Tau. Somewhere along the line, you got five days for a law. I picked Vung Tau because, believe it or not, I was only 50 miles away from where I was, but <laughs> in case there was an offensive going on for, with my unit, I didn't want to be that far away from it. But 50 miles away, it's like Tahiti. It's gorgeous. The most beautiful place you've ever seen. One time we had to escort a, uh, ambulances out. They, there was an ambulance. There was an ambulance. A bunch of GIs were wounded out in the jungle, and they couldn't fly choppers in because they because of the treetops. So we had to take them out with, with gun jeeps, and we took them out and, you know, going to this action, all this stuff, and all of a sudden it comes out to this most beautiful, serene, big Buddhist monastery, and it was just, took me back. It took me back. It was just like, so, so it was like Shangri-La. It was like nothing existed. It was like the most comfortable place in the world. It took me back. I took a picture, and I, I painted it. So in the middle of all this, here's something that's just in place but out of place, you know? I bring it back a little bit so, somehow. This was, uh, you know, I, as I said to you, I was in flight school before I, I, uh, uh, I came over. I knew all the pilots. So when there were non-combat missions, I used to jump aboard. One day my friend said, my buddy says, come on, jump aboard. I got to fly somewhere to something. And just as we get out there, he goes, his mission gets diverted. They got sent out to a, uh, there was a outpost way out towards the Cambodian border. And I got overrun, and what they would do is since an open area, the Viet Cong would take the supplies and go back to the jungle, but they would hang out in the jungle waiting to see who's coming there. So there was a ranger unit, recon unit, four-man unit they put in there, so we got called to go in there. I call this a hot LZ, you know, LZ being a landing zone and hot being you're going to take fire. But we got the guys out and it worked out. You know, you, you saw Miss Saigon. This is living proof, if you can see. One day I got them all to pose. These are juveniles, and, and you got to be careful with them because, you know what, they're outcasts. I mean, and, you know, they hung together, and they were on the delinquent side because, you know, nobody wanted them. They had to survive themselves, and, you know, and you just, just got to be careful around them. But, I, but that was part of the culture. They had to survive, too. And, uh, you know, uh, I took a picture and painted them. That was part of it. She took an orphans from both sides of the war who lost their parents. And she's, this is the way out in the jungle, by the way. And uh, she cut sugar cane to survive. And you know, probably there was about seven or eight more kids. <laughs> they were a little too shy to come in, but tremendous woman. Some of you know, you want to immortalize situations like that because people are doing the right things when they should. This, unfortunately, is a picture um, just that life goes on. I mean, I was in formation, and uh, this sergeant got sick, and they wanted to know the next senior man. It was me. So they, they picked this kid, he was 19 years old, uh, from Texas, I had a wife and a kid, and I trained him. He was a friend of mine, I trained him, he was in duty of the country, and he took my place on that patrol, and it took me about four minutes to get down to a police station, and in that time, the call came and he was killed in action. But this would be the patrol, I took a black and white picture, because when I was on patrol, because this is a patrol we all took, and this is a patrol he would have been on, so a memory of him, and by the way, I, I painted black and white because I wanted, that was kind of the mood, and it's on Home Depot plywood. I just wanted to make a little somber, but you know, I wanted to re people to remember him by this picture and the sacrifice that he made. My responsibility was both uh, civil and combat. So we had called out one time on, uh, they were setting up mortar tubes outside my post, so I, they, I got called out, I had to go out and get them. I chased them about half a mile to a leper colony. I don't do lepers, so <laughs> but you had to get back on post because they open up the fire bases and they do a scraping along the perimeters just out of precautionary. Now, if you notice in this picture, very interesting, 
So we're coming, this is a picture going back on posts and you know, f fun times going through the swamps and the insects and the bugs and the friendly fire and the, and the uh, if you notice, there's a battle going on on the other side of post. You know, at the time that we're coming back on. So it was the things that life goes on for me too. It goes on in this exhibition, it goes on for me. And uh, you know, I'm just happy I survived situations like this and others that I experienced and um, other GIs who experience things like that. I'm glad they, maybe they reflect a little bit on how lucky they are too. Now this is Bob Hope. So I had, I, I was in charge of taking, uh, do the Bob Hope's Christmas show. I did all the security, bringing him in and the talent in and getting them secure and also Sammy Davis Jr. in 1972. What's important about the video it describes some of the things that we just discussed, but also the methodology on, on how we painted them and, and why we painted them and uh, a little bit more in depth. You saw the series MASH in the old days. If they wanted to do a, a, a series, all the things that we saw as military police company in Vietnam could probably rewrite that show. Decided to step up and I became patrol supervisor. And Longman was the biggest military installation in Vietnam. I had 26 guys, 12 guys worked gates, 14 guys worked patrol, and then we had two dog units, and we worked 12-hour days, six weeks uh, nights, six weeks days, to say the least, uh, dramatic every day. I ran uh, a business race at New York City Speed for 45 years, and I didn't realize until I retired about three years ago that part of that running and part of that drive was to mask some of the things that I did see and did experience. When I came out of the service and I went to the VA, it was, you had lost the war. <laughs> Nobody wanted part, you know, you were a baby killer. Nobody wanted any part of it, you know. That was then, and I kind of went over there. There was, there was no agent R registry at the time. And this is 1972, and, uh, but that changed. You know what, the last, I, I didn't go back to the VA for 40 years until this situation. But I'll tell you what, the VA has really stepped up and done, you know, they have a lot of great programs. I, I got I got enrolled in prolonged exposure. I got long in stress tolerance. You know they have all these programs that for people with with psychological or PTSD uh, symptoms they have probably about seven or eight different programs on different levels that are very helpful. Okay. Plus they you know they'll uh, evaluate you certainly to where your abilities are. But my suggestion is too is find something that you're interested in. If you like to read, read books. If you like to paint paint, if you like to draw, draw, if you like to sing, join a choir, if you, uh, you know, if you uh, uh, like music, play an instrument, you know, take up something that you enjoy and focus on it. And if you focus on, on that, on, 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 on the positive, it'll help you take uh, care of the negative. <laughs>